Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us again today on Korea Business News Global Signs. Today, we'll be talking to Thomas Han, Executive Vice President at BBDO, based in New York City. Tom, welcome to our show. Hi, thank you for having me. Okay. Now, you started out in finance after college, but later decided to enter the advertising sector. At present, you're an executive vice president at BBDO, a premier advertising agency. Can you tell our viewers what motivated you to change industries? So I think my story is fairly typical. Honestly, I didn't love working 14 hour days. I wanted to see my family. I wanted to see the sun. But the through line, actually, from equity research to advertising is the search for insights. I think I always wanted to understand data and understand people, both consumers and customers and services, as well as management teams. And that was as vital then as it is now. And I quickly learned that the integrity of leadership, so not earnings, it wasn't PR, it wasn't guidance, integrity, that was the most important but intangible factor for evaluating a company. And I'd say I use those skills today. I mean, probably minus the modeling. Um, and it's very relevant for my job today. Now, Tom, what is the corona situation and the economic situation like in New York at present? So, unlike a lot of the nation, New York seems to be flattening the curve. So people are taking it pretty seriously. And most people here, I'd say almost everyone I see, wear the mask, respect social distancing. Economically, we've just entered phase four. And this is the final stage of reopening. And, you know, there's a, all these benchmarks we needed to pass as well as like zero COVID deaths early in the week. I think there were a couple the other day. Um, and baseball is back. I'm actually missing some of the Yankee games right now to talk to you. So there are signs of normalcy, but things are definitely not back to normal here. Most offices have not yet reopened and things like indoor seating at restaurants um, or gyms and museums and theaters, they're not open. The general outlook is actually pretty grim. I think if you look at unemployment, for example, it's hovering around 18 or 26% in the city, depending on what you're counting. And a full third of small business may never reopen. So there's definitely this sense that things are getting better, but we're not through this yet. Well, let's hope for the best. Now, Tom, because of the coronavirus, people are avoiding contact. Now, what are the effects of COVID-19 on the advertising industry? More specifically, what changes will take place in the advertising sector, especially regarding online and broadcast advertising and SNS ads? So, so naturally, there's been an impact with businesses shuttered, with people sheltering in place for months, and major media events either canceled or delayed, like think the Tokyo Olympics. And here in the States, we didn't really start taking this seriously until mid-March. And then brands reacted in two ways. You know, some slash budgets like you would expect with the pandemic, while others actually increased spending. And what's interesting about those who acted was they weren't trying to sell anything during this time. And they really was this moment of reflection for brands, this moment where they thought about their values, what they stand for, why they offer anything to the world and why you as a customer should care. So they use their communications to convey this empathy and this solid solidarity. And most importantly, they started doing acts of social good. So think things like offering customers free services or reducing or eliminating fees. And some even converted manufacturing facilities to directly aid frontline workers. And it was a pretty incredible response. I think looking ahead, very progressive marketers are going to kind of continue this strategic investment, and they're going to use it to strengthen their relationship. They're going to use this as an opportunity for gain. I think they're going to increase R&D to develop better, more personalized services and experiences for customers, and they're going to do so while continuing to make operational efficiencies versus simply slashing budgets. You know, in fact, analysis of recessions in the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s show that companies that actually strategically spent ended up outperforming their competitors by 10% when growth resumed. Now, unlike other states, 
New York seems to be doing much better because of Governor Cuomo's really aggressive response to the coronavirus with concerns of proliferation. New Yorkers are encouraged to wear masks. Can you tell our viewers how New Yorkers are actually responding to the wearing of masks? So I live, I live in the financial district in Manhattan, and, and we're, we're wearing masks. I think being in the epicenter of the initial outbreak and our population density just helps us take it a bit more seriously. The sad truth is people don't change their behavior, especially if it's inconvenient, unless they have to. And it has to feel real to them. And I think it was very real for New Yorkers. Um, it was rare to not know someone who was sick or maybe someone who had lost someone to COVID. So the last five months, I think, have been a real moment. You know, I think when you move and you travel a little in the rest of the country, it's easier to see it as something that doesn't affect us. Now, Tom, unlike Governor Cuomo, the governors of Florida and Georgia don't seem to be responding aggressively to COVID-19. Now, can you, can you tell us what Americans think about wearing masks and the use of hand sanitizers? More importantly, can you tell us the differences in views which are influenced the way people are responding to the virus? Yeah. Unfortunately, basic health and safety has been politicized in this country. And somehow, there are people who believe that masks symbolize weakness. It's not about public health or safety. And that wearing a mask means that somehow you're capitulating, you're giving up. Um, others, I honestly feel it's propaganda. They think this is fake news, that it isn't real. And not surprisingly, these polarized views fall completely along party lines. So Democrats are more likely than Republicans to wear masks. I mean, the data shows all of this. But for me, I think ultimately it's a sign of privilege. The non-mask wearer isn't on the front lines. They're not essential workers, and they don't run a higher risk of contracting the disease. And I think they feel secure in their public safety, and frankly, they can afford to take this cavalier attitude, even if it's selfish. I think Governor Cuomo said it best that a mask is a symbol, but it's a symbol of respect, and it's a symbol of respect for yourself and for your community. And I hope, I honestly hope, that people will see that it's literally the easiest thing you can do. It's the least you can do to actually contribute to helping each other and to help restart the economy. Well, let's hope people wear masks. Now, what are your thoughts about the upcoming U.S. presidential election? It looks like Wall Street is finally supporting former Vice President Biden. Do you think President Trump's chances of re-election is now over? Or do you think he can emerge victorious in November? Yeah. It isn't over until it's over. And I think anyone who thinks it is wasn't paying attention in 2016. That said, Joe Biden is not Hillary Clinton. He doesn't come with the same baggage. Um, I think he's viewed very much as a safe choice. He doesn't rock the boat. He's not polarizing. He's a moderate. He's not radical. And honestly, the worst his opposition can muster is that he's old or he's boring. And I think the U.S. and, and maybe the world could use someone who's a little bit boring right now. And I've known Joe my entire life, so, so not personally. But I grew up in Delaware, where he was my senator for 30-odd years. And whatever else anyone can say, I, I honestly believe that he's a good man. And I believe he'd be a good president. And, and maybe most importantly, he'd be a good president for everyone, whatever your ideology, and if you live in a red or blue state. Well, Delaware seems like a lovely state. Now, after President Trump became president, the U.S. stock markets hit an all-time high. Do you think that the market will continue to rise until the upcoming presidential election? I think the analysts in the world think so. I think if you look at the impact of COVID, it seems to have already been accounted for in second quarter earnings, and everyone seems to be modeling a full rebound. And it's the only way that can explain the near 50% rally since March. Um, it seems like the orientation of everyone is to look ahead you know, versus where we've been, or frankly, where I think we still are. And the perceptions of a Biden presidency shouldn't do anything to change this optimism. I see. Now, Tom, finally, 
Would you like to share any stock market uh, recommendations with our viewers today? In my business, we study consumer sentiment and behavior because where people go, business follows. And in light of COVID, we've really been looking at what behaviors are temporary, like reduced travel, or what are ones that are emerging and growing and that are perhaps changing forever. So I would look at companies that are best situated to capitalize on these trends, both in the near and long term. So one area of growth is home entertainment. So think about your gaming companies and your streaming F5, your subscription video on demand services. So I like stocks like NCSoft because they're particularly well positioned, I think, to capitalize on this. And stocks like Watcha, the OTT streaming platform might be a great opportunity as they're set to go public next summer. I also like IT infrastructure, like cloud and data services, as more and more of our lives become digital. So stocks like NHN, who sit at the heart of this cloud, fintech, entertainment, are very interesting. I also wouldn't count out the telecom providers like LG U Plus as 5G rolls out. And I know um, the hype in Korea must be the same as it's been in the U.S., that everyone is kind of tired of talking about 5G. But I honestly believe 5G technology is just going to usher in the next wave of innovation. So when you think about zero latency, blazing speed and connection, that's actually going to be the power for driverless cars, smart city and homes, and massive IoT, just sensors connected to everything. And lastly, I think we're seeing that connection, both in the literal sense and in the figurative sense, between people, between businesses, they're more important than ever. So I think services like Cacao will only continue to grow, especially as these networks continue to create these rich, like self-contained ecosystems that are all within their app, where they can now offer pretty much everything from content to entertainment to transportation to financial services. Thomas Hahn, Executive Vice President at BBDO, thank you for taking time to share your views with us today on Global Signs. Thomas Hahn recommends several stocks for our viewers today. Several are listed. One is NHN for FinTech, Entertainment, and Cloud Business. Second company is LGU Plus for 5G rollout. The third company is Kakao because he believes that uh, Kakao will continue to provide growth in content and entertainment. And the last company is called Wacha, which will be going public early next year. I want to thank everyone again today for joining us on Global Signs on Korea Business News. Thank you very much. I look forward to seeing everyone again very soon.